All right, so in this lesson, we are continuing our discussion on the basics of confidence intervals, wrapping our heads around what they are and what they can do for us. And this lesson should go a little quicker than the last one, I believe. We just have a few extra pieces that we have to kind of establish with regards to confidence interval basics. Now, to start things off, I want to draw your attention back to my example from 8.1a. And in that example, in my little demonstration, I was looking at the average number of social media posts that a teenager in the U.S. views in a day. So the average number of posts. There is an actual average for the true number of posts that you guys view on the Instagram or whatever it is that you all use. Um, but we don't know what it is. But there is an actual average. Okay. Now, we learned, though, that the distribution of X bar, or in other words, our sample mean or sample average, was approximately normal, and it was centered at mu. So this guy right here is X bar's graph for the sample mean that we actually take, and the center of this graph is at mu. So if this was chapter 7, what we would do is we would take a sample and another sample and another sample and do it lots and lots of times we would get a picture like this for our sampling distribution and we would look at that picture and it would line up at actual mu when we would know the answer. In real life with statistics though, we don't have the luxury of taking tons and tons and tons of samples. We kind of just get one sample and we go with it, okay? So I might get a value for X bar that's like here, for example. And that's all I know right here in green. The rest of that picture, the mu where it actually equals and everything would kind of be dark to me because I wouldn't have access to that. All I would know is this value right here. So the idea behind confidence intervals is, well, we know X bars graph looks approximately normal. And we also know in a normal distribution that if we go a certain number of standard deviations away from the middle, we have different amounts of data that fit in those ranges. In other words, 68% of numbers that X bar could be for our problem are within one standard deviation of the mean. And then if we were to go two standard deviations each way, that was 95% of different values for X bar. So all I have, I have literally a number line with an X bar on it. That is all I know when I collect my sample. I don't have access to all this red info up here, but 95% of the X bars that I could get are within two standard deviations of the middle, which is mu. So that thought process works backwards too. If 95% of X bars are within two standard deviations of mu, that means my X bar right here must also be within two standard deviations of mu 95% of the time. So that's probably a little bit fuzzy and weird to understand. And that's okay if it is. We'll do more with the nitty gritty of all of this later on in the chapter. What I need you to understand right now in this video is two things. First of all, we talk about margin of error. Oh gosh, how far should I spread apart my arms right here? And that influences our percent confidence, our confidence level. Well, if you wanted to break down the margin of error further, it really breaks into how many standard deviations do you want to go from the mean? Because we already know how to do that in a normal distribution. So if I want 95% of my X bars to fit in this situation, well, I would go two standard deviations from the mean. So the number of standard deviations you go is directly tied to the confidence level that we bring into this problem. That conceptually is kind of a big idea. Like I said, if that is weird and iffy, we'll get to more of this later on in the chapter. But what I want to do for right now is go one step further from what I did last lesson. Last lesson, we learned that if we wanted to make a confidence interval, what we did is we took our point estimates. Our point estimate is just what we get from our sample, so x bar in my example, or p hat, or whatever it's gonna be, plus or minus our margin of error. What I'm going to do 
is break down this margin of error one step further. The margin of error can actually be broken down into two components. So it's gonna be our point estimate, plus or minus, something called a critical value times the standard deviation of our statistic. So the margin of error is composed of two things. I just got done telling you guys a minute ago, 95% of X bar values are within two standard deviations of the mean. Well, the two is my critical value. It's basically saying, how many standard deviations away do you wanna go? And then we won't have the standard deviation of mu itself, or we don't have like our population standard deviation, but we have the standard deviation for X bars graph. So it's the standard deviation of our statistic. This little purple formula is written on your formula sheet for um, AP stats, but we will talk more about these pieces later on. Just appreciate this counts the number of standard deviations. This is the actual standard deviation for your statistic, and both of these put together are called a margin of error. Okay, so at least know this purple part. We'll do more with this later on in the chapter if the last slide was still shaky. So let's go ahead then and talk about a few other things related to margin of error. Why do we want to have a small margin of error? Well, that should be kind of straightforward to you guys if you think about it. Why do we want a small margin of error? It's that Garfield comic again. Small margin of error means you have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Big margin of error means we can't really say. So why do we want a small margin of error? It gives us more precision. So we know what to think. Okay, if our margin of error was too big, we wouldn't know what to think in the first place. And there are gonna be two ways, two main ways, you can reduce your margin of error, making your margin of error smaller, making your interval tighter. Option one has to do with the confidence level. Okay, so I talked about this last video, but let me see if you guys can remember what I went into there. Let's say I'm at a 95% confidence interval, and I wanna switch it to a 90. So I'm going from 95 to 90. Will the 90 be wider or narrower than the 95? Okay, so think on that, wider or narrower. Here's my 95. If 95% of intervals this size will capture the true answer, and I switch to a 90, I'm gonna catch the answer less frequently. It's actually gonna be a smaller interval because it's less, I don't wanna get probability, like, cause you're not supposed to mention that, but it's gonna be less likely that you'll catch the answer when you're small. If you get a nice big interval, like right here, a 99% confidence interval, now you're a lot more likely to catch the right answer. So one thing you can do to reduce the margin of error is you can reduce your confidence level. So if you reduce the confidence level, that'd be like going from a 95 to a 90 or something like that. Is there a drawback to doing this? Well, yeah, you're gonna miss more often. So the drawback will miss more frequently. So that's not ideal. The other way that you can um, reduce your margin of error, which is easier to control, is you can increase your sample size. Margin of error means that there's some cloudiness where you're not sure how things are gonna go overall. You might have lots of variability in your X bar values. So X bar varies from here to here to here and so on. One way you can reduce variability, we've talked about this a lot already in this class, is you increase sample size. When you increase your sample size, you get a better picture of what's actually going on. And when you have a clearer picture, you can become like more honed in on what you think the answer is. So logically, that kind of makes sense. Um, what is a drawback to this? The biggest drawback is time and money to increasing sample size. 
But yeah, if you increase your sample size, you will get a tighter interval because you become more honed in on what you think the actual answer is. Or the more mathy, better probably way of thinking about it is that it reduces the variability in your statistic, X bar, P hat, whatever. So there are two main kind of things that I want to alert you to, or a book alerts you to right now with regards to confidence intervals and just misconceptions people have. First one isn't so much a misconception, but our class only looks at data from a simple random sample, SRS. So any confidence interval problem we analyze in AP stats is gonna be an S coming from an SRS. We learned about those other techniques like stratified sampling for one, and stratified sampling has a slightly more complicated version of what we teach you in AP stats. It's not that like you couldn't learn it, it's just more complicated. And they kind of said, you know what, let's just get real good at SRS. Lots of polling things in real life come from stratified samples. So there is like little tweaks that you make to your formula that you don't need to worry about. So just understand that any data in AP stats will come from an SRS when you're asked to analyze it. If it was a different kind, you you'd use a slightly modified formula. The other thing that actually is a misconception here has to do with what a confidence interval does for us, what it fixes for us. Confidence intervals account for sampling variability not bias. What does that mean? Let's say I did a bad job collecting my data in the first place. I had some response bias going on where the wording of my question made people like answer a certain way. A confidence interval, just spreading it out, doesn't fix bias. It doesn't fix the original problem caused by my question or my data collection. If you start with bad data, it doesn't matter how much fancy statistics you know, not gonna help you at all, okay? So when you do, any sort of a problem with confidence intervals, don't think that bias is somehow fixed by dealing with an interval instead of just a single estimate. It fixes the variability that you get naturally. It does not fix bias. You have to start over if your data collection is biased. And then we're going to wrap up this video by talking about an example here and just practicing a little more with all of our concepts. You can also have confidence intervals, not just for one thing. Like I looked at average social media posts. I looked at average steps taken in this company. I looked at approval of um, climate change, one kind of group. You can also use a confidence interval to compare two different groups. And like we've talked about before, you compare two groups using subtraction most frequently. So this is a relatively recent poll, January 2020, Pew Research again, looking at almost 7,000 U.S. voters, and they asked whether they believe that there is too much economic inequality in the U.S. today. So it's looking at the percent of people, Democrats, Republicans, who think there's too much economic inequality. So they generated a 90% confidence interval for the difference in proportion. So we are not looking at the actual percentages themselves. The interval that they got went from 34.6% to 39.4%. That's not saying Democrat or Republican, 36 or 39% of people agree. That's not what's going on. We are analyzing the difference in the two groups. Whenever you analyze the difference in a problem, you need to specify the direction you are subtracting. So they went Democrat minus Republican. They could have just as easily gone Republican minus Democrat. Doesn't matter, but they have to tell you what they did, okay? So think about what this is telling us. Again, this does not mean that 34% of Democrats or 34% of Republicans thought a certain way. It is saying that if you subtract the Democrat number minus the Republican number, you get something that's between 34 and 39. So for example, Democrat could be like 80, I'll go 84 for easy math, and then Republican could be 50. I could subtract those, I would get 34. It could be where Democrat is 54 and Republican is 
I can't do math right now, 10 or something like that. That's no 20. Um, we don't know what the actual data numbers were. All we are analyzing is the difference. Okay. What this does tell us though, is that the Democrat number is 34 to 39% higher in value than the Republican number. How did I know the Democrat was higher? Well, if you subtract them, you get a positive number here. So the bigger one must be first, bigger minus smaller makes positives. If I decided, oh, you know what, I'm gonna do Republican minus Democrat. Well, what I would see then is I would see negative numbers in my interval. So you can easily have negatives instead of positives. It's all about the direction of the subtraction. Since our numbers are positive, the Democrats were higher in this problem. So interpret the confidence level. Why don't you pause and try that for yourself? And I'll talk about it out loud in just a second and pop the answer up there. All right, so there you can see a model solution for the confidence level. The level is talking about the percentage itself. And the percentage tells us over lots of intervals, what percent of them should we expect to capture the true proportion, whatever it is. Um, when we're looking at these again, avoid talking about probability. You just talk about many samples, many confidence intervals. And in this case, 90% of them were gonna capture the real answer. Next up, it got chopped off on my slide here, I guess. But part B, I asked to interpret the confidence interval. So that's our we are blank percent confidence script. So pause me, try that out, and then I'll write down our model solution for that. Okay, so I've got the answer for this one, our little scripts written down right there. Again, practice this, learn it, know it, but this is how you would interpret the interval itself. We're 90% confident that the interval from 34 to 39 captures the true difference. And when you talk about difference, make sure you specify the direction you're subtracting in your answer. Who believe there's too much economic inequality? So what is this saying in everyday English? There's my scripts. In everyday English, 34 to 39% more Democrats think there's too much inequality than Republicans. That's what that is saying. Okay. So let's go on and talk about our last two questions on this. Based on this interval, is there convincing evidence that the proportion of Democrats who agree is greater than the proportion of Republicans? So it was 0.346 to 394. 0.346 2.394. Is this convincing that Democrats is greater than Republicans for this problem, no, given that we subtracted D minus R? Well, think about what it would mean if there was no difference between the two groups. If there was no difference and Democrats and Republicans felt the same on this issue, you would see the number zero in your interval. Because what that would mean is that Democrat number minus Republican number would be the same. Same number minus same number equals zero. So when they ask you about this sort of a question right here, when you have a two group problem, what you're gonna do is look to see if zero is contained in that interval. You can also look to see if you have negatives and positives because a positive means Democrat was higher, a negative means Republican was higher. So if this number right here, for example, was a negative number, I wouldn't know what to think. I'd have negatives and positives. But since everything is positive here, that tells me that yes, Democrats, there's convincing evidence that Democrats have a more agreement with this statement than Republicans do. So I'll write that up as an answer. All right, so there you have a little model solution for that question. And then the final thing that we're trying to do in this problem is we're just looking at how changing our confidence level would affect the problem. So if we went from a 90%, we're already at a 90, and we went to a 99, would it be wider? Would it be narrower? Would it be the same? And as we talked about earlier, higher degree of confidence means your interval needs to be wider. That way you can be sure that you're going to catch the answer. So it turns out that a 99% confidence interval, given that everything else is the same, would be wider than a um, 90%. If I was going to write out a full fancy solution, I would say it's wider because the higher degree of confidence requires a larger margin of error to be sure that we capture the right answer more frequently. But let's just write wider for this one and call it good.